Welcome everyone to the second reading of this year's April is Poetry Month in Limerick Festival. Tonight, the Ottawa Literary Gathering present a reading with three poets, Owen Devereaux, Anne Donnellan and Stanley Knott. Owen Devereaux's creative writing has featured in the Irish Times, Hennessy, New Irish Writing, the poetry program RTE and on Sunday Miscellany. His poem, The Bullfield, was recently published in the Poetry Ireland anthology, Vital Signs on Poetry and Medicine, edited by Martin Dyer. The Bodhi Tree was shortlisted for a Hennessy Award in 2018. He has performed his work on podcasts such as Eat the Storms and the Poetry Ireland's Words Likely Spoken. He has been published in the Stony Thursday book, The Ohm Stone and the Poetry Bus. A new prose poem has just been published for the Cheltenham based journal Lish 102. In 2022, he curated the uh, Limerick Broadsheet, April is the Cruelest Month, featuring work by Kerry O'Brien, Emily Cullen, John Lilly, Denise Shalia, and novelist Donald Ryan. Owen teaches on the MA in Creative Writing at the University of Limerick, where he leads the module Creative Writers in the Community. Owen Devereaux. Thanks, Tom, and uh, thank you uh, to Dominic for inviting me to read again uh, this year, um, and to all of you who are here uh, this evening. So I'm going to read a selection of poems. Um, the first three are about a really small geographical area, not too far from here, in Limerick City, uh, around uh, Mulberry Street and the Roxburgh Road, near where the prison and the psychiatric hospital um, are located. And then I will read uh, two other pieces um, that are more personal and more broadly based. So I'm going to begin with uh, the poem that um, Tom mentioned there in the introduction, and it's called The Bull Field. Now I grew up um, in an estate in Limerick called Kennedy Park, and Kennedy Park before it was Kennedy Park, uh, it was called The Bull Field. And this is about the bull field, because it was a field that was once used by the psychiatric hospital in Liverpool. On All Souls Day, I knelt down on the mottled tundra clay, ear cupped to the frozen ground. I could faintly hear the murmurings of men, buried nameless in the pauper's grave. Simple men like Francie Murphy and Brendan Plunkett, let out for the day to belly crawl over damp drills, hand-picking potatoes, greyhound cabbage, carrots, turnips, mangles. It takes a lot of work to feed a hospital. In the bull field, I see Matty Keane and Pa O'Brien, able-bodied innocents, chopping wood or ricking turf, throwing the odd players of woodbine as payment for their toil. In the bull field, I see tormented men like Jim Sullivan and Dinny Ryan, fattening pigs with sour milk and potato skins, slopping out greeny brown scutter from their pens. I see them all and somehow cannot deny them, men who were dumped in silence at first light, from the back of a blue Ford tractor, exchanging their labour for bed and board in the madhouse named after the patron saint of workers. So the hospital referred to in that uh, poem is a hospital called St. Joseph's, which was, since the mid-19th century, the uh, psychiatric hospital in Limerick uh, City. And um, it's located on Mulgrave Street. And growing up in Limerick, like many other people, uh, Mulgrave Street was always a fascinating place to me, because we would have called it the street of the mad, the dead, and the bad. Mm. As the prison, the psychiatric hospital, homeless shelter, the gra graveyard, and so on. And to me, it's always been the most interesting street in Limerick. And um, the next poem is called Ordnance Survey, 1974. And it's about that street. It's about a character called Bisto. And then it is about other people, including uh, Jim Kenny, and references also to Kate O'Brien. Ordnance Survey, 1974. With neither map nor compass, 
Ordnance House, Newton Mahan, is my starting point as I, as I traipse the street of the mad, the dead and the bad. At the pitch pine gates of Shaw's bloody slaughterhouse, the sweet and sour smell of pig shit wafts over the squeals of terror. The siren beckons clogged pork butchers, sharpening their knives of steel to carve the finest cuts of ham and bacon for the bone china plates of the well-heeled, while the city's poor devour the entrails of swine. Under the watchtower of the jail, in front of its needle-pointed railings, my first salute <coughs> is from a dancing, tweed-coated, toothless man. Well, boss, he says, as he waltzes alone. His name is Raymond Troy, but known to all since the day he was born as Bisto. Caruso arms, outstretched, he sways and sings a ballad of his own making. This street was named after the Lord Lieutenant. He visited just once when we had landlords and tenants. The son of a Tory, he became a Whig, the majestic boulevards known for the pig a writer and dandy by temperament, too honest in politics. They say he was the last of the true romantics. Oh, Normanby Street has everything, markets to sell butter, pigs and hay, a battery to keep the natives at bay, a cobbled yard to drill young men, sent out to die for empire and king. It is early houses, for the thirsty and loveless, a boot factory for the shoeless, a jail to punish the poor, a tea importer, a headstone maker, a dusty flour mill for the baker, a rope walk for making a noose, a fair green with frisky horses and wild cattle on the loose, a madhouse if you're not right in the head, a spacious graveyard for when you're dead. The whole town knows Bisto. He drank a spinster aunt's farm, 40 good acres with frontage near Ballybricken, in the rats from drink, but well enough to be let out each morning from the lunatic asylum. In his surgeon's hands, the singing, waltzing Piero clenches a crumpled paper twist to cargo coins of silver and copper when he heads to Mousy Delaney, the blind huckster. Bisto's scribbled list doesn't vary very much. A golden pimple next quart of Lucasade for poor demented Jackie Stritch. A few loose players for Mad Mary, the examiner for Father Tom Tracy. A bar of fries for Jimmy Morrissey. Hair clips and rouge for Michael the Lady. When his errands are complete, Bisto will return to Joseph's, where straight Jack at a time is counted by the asylum's four-faced clock. The days of ice-cold baths are long gone, banished like the all-seeing eyes of the, of the governor's panopticon. In these more enlightened days, the tormented are treated with wonder drugs, talk therapy and ECT. I continue my stroll, nodding at a few more familiar faces, broken men and women whose countenances are marked out with the crow's feet of poverty. I pass the gaunt Victorian villas. On the left-hand side of the street, Baru House is my next stop, constructed in 1880 AD. A lofty red brick house, built for a horse dealer with notions. Just last week, an obituary in the Times of London revealed that his famous writer daughter was sadly deceased. 200 yards up the street, just across from the pike, the fair green wall is beginning to crumble. White, hand-painted words boldly proclaim, Kelly for the council. I first heard of Big Jim at my grandmother's funeral. Under a black mantilla, a pillar of the community asked, What's that fucking communist doing here? The solid stonemason stayed at the back of the cathedral, quietly paying his respects. I cross the fort road, Continuing on my way, my quarry this August morning is to find the final resting place of Ellen Sharkey. Aged 53 in 1855, Ellen was the very first to be placed on the stony, loamy soil at Spitalland, location 90A. For six years, the wealthy of the town refused to be buried alongside the poor, the starving and demented. 
This was finally resolved by creating separate quarters for the poor and the quality. Who says debt has no hierarchy? So the third uh, poem in that set of poems is a new poem. Haven't read it before. Um, those of you who are of a certain vintage will be familiar with or might be familiar with the uh, term or phrase conscience money. Mm. So if you stole something in Boyd's of Limerick or Newsom's of Limerick or Todd's of Limerick and you felt bad about it afterwards, you would send uh, the money to the Limerick Chronicle and they would acknowledge receipt of the conscience money, you know, right, yeah. no, I'm sorry, I tell you, I'm missing miss the story. You would send it to Boyd's or whoever you stole from, they would publish an advert and say, you know, Boyd's acknowledge the receipt of one pound for whatever, right? Huh. So uh, this is a phenomenon, I was fascinated when I was a child seeing these uh, 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 signs. So this is a poem called Conscience Money and it's, it's a, a poem, a lot of times we have very idyllic notions about childhood and children can be little shit sometimes, they can be really cruel people and this is a, a story about cruelty. And, it's again in, 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 the, in the context of the psychiatric hospital in Limerick. As soon as my well-heeled uncle hands with me a dirty quid and a ten bob note, I exchanged my paper purty in Doggy Duggan's shop. He, he snake slid the thirty pieces of silver across the stunted counter of mock alabaster. His yellowed sausage fingers reeked of sour milk and Alsatian shit. Pockets brimful, I jangled round a country mile to St. Brendan's Asylum. In the muddy plain fields, over the eight-foot karst wall, a quartet of patients were taking the fresh air, slow motion strolling, their dead legs pacing, playing mind games of their own making. Going against the grain of my ill-gotten reputation for being a golden boy, I gulled all four into thinking I was kind. I gulled all four into believing that I was their friend. I gently called each of them by name, first given to them at birth, and grigged them, tossing the shiny coins in the air, egging on Johnny Raw and Mad Mary, urging them to form a ballless scrum with Paddy Notos and Mikey Cleary. All four did as they were told. A lifetime of hidden injuries from church, state and family had worn them down to play the bit parts of scarecrow, lunatic and clown, barely living half-lives in the half-light of this two-horse town. How am I doing for time there, Dominic? Am I... You're okay. Yeah? Okay. <coughs> so, where will I go next? Oh yeah, so... Um, Conscious of time, uh, but so I will drop one of the poems on my list. But I want to read you this poem and then two other ones that aren't that aren't too long. Um, so it's a poem called Prize Giving, and um, I'm a big fan of uh, Samuel Beckett. And before Desmond O'Grady died. Um, he and I had a very interesting conversation where he talked about proposing that my uncle, Seamus O'Canadian, might stand in as a doppelganger for Samuel Beckett mm -hmm. at the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Beckett was very reluctant, did not want to go, and my uncle was uh, very similar actually in visage and hairstyle mm -hmm. and so on to, to Samuel Beckett. And, I became intrigued as, well as I grew older and became more interested in Samuel Beckett and the story of his life and his writings. I became really uh, intrigued by this conversation that Desmond O'Grady had with Samuel Beckett in Paris about my uncle uh, in, in Limerick. Prize giving. When Stockholm telegrammed Sam with the, with the catastrophic news of a prize, Beckett hid in the Ria Hotel on the wind and rain swept coast at Nibul. A quick phone call was placed to the poet O'Grady in an effort to ascertain if Beckett's doppelganger from Limerick Town might be available. However, the lean and sprightly figure of Seamus O'Canada was nowhere to be found. Not wanting to cause upset, Beckett weighed up the cons and pros of whether he should stay put or go. 
It was in the milky twilight, facing down the engulfing waves of fame that had dawned on him. Jerome Linden, his loyal friend and publisher, would go in his stead to face the turnips at the August December ceremony. <laughs> So I'm going to read um, two other uh, pieces for you, and um, as my, when I, I'm asked to describe my poetry, and, uh, you know, it's obviously personal, it's also quite political, and uh, sometimes you say you're a very, a very political poet, and I don't think you could be anything else but a political poet, uh, I think, you know, if you're, if you're a great person, you should be engaging with issues about the world, uh, so it's all expressions, political in one way <coughs> or another. Um, I've written a lot about homelessness and the experience of homelessness. And uh, so I'm going to finish this evening with two poems about this particular uh, theme. And uh, just saying there before uh, the, the readings that Ireland, hardly need reminding, is it's becoming more and more like the 19th century here. I mean, in terms of people's rights, in terms of right to a home, and a safe place, and so on. So the first poem um, is called Panthera. And it's a conversation between a mother and her daughter in a hotel bedroom in Dublin. Panthera. Just eight winters old, hope my daughter is sleepless because of the din seeping through the scrubbed pine floorboards of tonight's temporary resting place, a snug hotel room big enough to swing an anorexic tomcat in. Tell me another story, ma'am, from when you were small. I put down my click-clacking needles to weave her a familiar yarn, rehearsing a well-worn well tale about my very first storybook. On the cold but dry daffodil February day, I first held it in my lilliput hands. How did you pay for it? For one whole year, I saved and saved. Eight fistfuls of dirty coppers. I plank them in a chiver's jar in the always night cubby hole under the stairs. Then I handed them over to the stout grey cardigan assistant in that big bookshop by the bus stop in town. And you could hardly see over the counter. Yes, I was short legged for my age, but that didn't stop me from racing home, leaping across streets, lanes, rows, and bows to devour the strange words and savour the wild pictures scattered across the savanna of every single page, dangling my feet on the third step of the line out stairs. What was it called and what was it all about? The brave Indian lion. He lived under the shade of a banyan tree in the Gur forest. Short of mane, he was known to all far and near for his caring nature, his wisdom and kindness, especially to those who were weaker than him. Did he help people like us? He really cared for people like us, the roofless, the faceless, the voiceless. He lifted people who had fallen. He minded people who were broken. He fed people who were hungry. He calmed people who were angry. He was a very, very brave lion in the face of all adversity. My worry stone words reassure. And for now, the questions cease. In spite of the party conference noise, under the floorboards, hope my daughter drifts into a safe harbour of sleep. So the final poem is also about homelessness and it's a poem which uh, is called Cribbing. And I've always loved that word, the word my mother would have used, you know, he or she is cribbing about something, you know, and of course cribbing can, can denote lots of different things, you know, literally where you sleep being a crib, and cribbing uh, is in complaining. And this poem, um, the poem that I'm going to read to you is set in Dublin, but I should tell you that it's based on, the kind of core of the story is based on a very real event that happened five minutes from where we are here uh, in Limerick City. Um, and a young man, uh, an asylum seeker, um, went to rest, went to sleep in the place of baby Jesus in the crib in a church not too far from here. And I thought it was quite symbolic in terms of what he did. And of course the police got involved and it was you know, a complicated case and so on. I just thought it was a very interesting uh, event. And so I wrote a poem around it, but I set the poem, in, uh, set the poem elsewhere um, uh, to, to play with the ideas that I had. Cribbing. 
To be perfectly honest with you, I knew exactly what I was doing when I swapped places with a baby Jesus in the pro-cathedral crib. It was just before the sarcosan bolted the heavy oak doors to shut out the cold, dark, unforgiving night. I stepped over the low trellis, undressed and hid, crouched between Mary and Joseph. The red chancel lamp flickered and slow danced on the Jerusalem gold marble altar, but I soon fell asleep. I'd sleep on a clothesline me. My silent, holy sanctuary was short-lived. I was discovered in the grey light by the elderly, early elderly faithful who were horrified to see a homeless black asylum seeker sleeping naked on the hard straw strewn floor of their sacred Christmas crib. I was quickly shepherded away, swaddled in a standard issue Garda overcoat, size 3XL, kicking and screaming, screaming and kicking to be penned up in the local bridewell. Handcuffed to the squad car, I was called scrounger, waster, madman. I met their questions with a wall of silence, so I was whipped with wet towels. They left no marks, but at least I had a bed for the night. The following morning, after a hearty breakfast, an emergency sitting of Dublin District Court heard serious charges concerning public order and trespass. The priest, sarcaston and parishioners told of their distress. Oh, we do our bit for the homeless. What with our sale of work, soup runs and annual charity ball. Adding that staple, this is a very quiet community. Things like this never happen around here. For my part, I accepted neither solicitor nor interpreter, asking instead to represent myself. The judge asked if I had anything to say. Your Honour, I said, I did this to take a stand against the jealous faced politicians who pretend to care, the fire brigade journalists who parachute in once a year, the vulture banks and speculators who prey on the homeless and the poor. I did this for those hostile forever in direct provision, those young mothers on endless housing waiting lists, those sleeping in doorways, under bridges, in cars, those sleeping in skips, in little tents above in the Phoenix Park. Although, given what we saw this morning, people sleeping in tents in the Phoenix Park were removed by the guards. Those sleeping in, in skips in little tents above in the Phoenix Park, those queuing for food parcels, those hidden families imprisoned in cheap hotels, the 198,358 empty dwellings just waiting to be lifted. Thank you. Thank you. statements on human rights issues because they were so much part of my life that I did actually have written quite a lot 
of my, my earlier poems were all in that vein. But then the pest kind of crept up on me. And it's this funny thing really, I'm sure all of you that are writers would know, you, you kind of have to write the past out of you. And that's what I started to do. And I, I never expected to be doing these type of poems, but this is how it all started. And um, I'm going to start with a poem called Heritage. I'd love to see. It at Heritage after Joel Taylor. It is said that when they opened him, they found a railway depot in his chest. And inside the depot, a pile of peaked capped men lugged black brown to the red roaring bowl. Their shovel grumble blended away with banter. His blood, white capped broth of porther barn, lungs woodbine smoke scarfs and dawn cycles, tongue numb with the habit of silence, died in side eye view of the red jawed one his father carrying brother forever there, close as packed straw to the barn gable. And if you opened him, you would find a wad of betting stubs, tar-scented twine, and a four-pronged fork stuffed in his chest, hope for spurt in the final stretch, like swallows returned to nest in the rafters, ritual rooted him in the blue vein of loyal. And his mother's briar-edged face thrown on the hob. It is said that if you opened her, you would find a heart lined with barbed wire, pulse steady as an ash trunk, tear ducts plugged like rain trapped in a concrete trough, four score stabs of departure, her shut out hurt. And the next poem is called Pickery. And very much a lot of these poems are about the work that women did. And again, it's all more than 50 years ago. Um, Pickering. Never want to show softness. My grandmother's dented marriage band revealed the grind of her time. Her rose gold stuck in the metal of the pig's nose as she lobbed pounded potatoes on the trough. Spilled with feed in the shed belly, she was swung by the swine, flung to stone like a bag of meal. She clung till the pig ring snapped, then gathered her galvanised bucket, steadied her stride home to cast iron pot, hooked from the kitchen fire crane, stirred boiling bacon for her bachelor sons. September Sunday night, when all were out in town, she died on the hob. It was hard to remove the ring, her skin beneath was soft. Now my next poem is called Kindaley, and it's really about the parish I come from. And it's called Kilmaley. But I was afraid to call it the real name. I felt there might have been a bit of consternation, so I'm trying to cloud the issues here, just in case. So, Kildaley after George Ella Lyon. I am from barrows of dung and bog scraw flung on stony ground. I am from flowery lumps of new potatoes, from salty blocks of homemade butter cased in glazed tan crockery. I am from hawthorn and hazel stick, the open fire of crackle and weep. Comfort perched on the hob in my grandmother's concrete kitchen. I'm from the shrieking pig on killing day, from pork steaks portioned for relations, secret recipe of blood pudding preserved. I'm from snows for sherry tipping ladies, from porther pubs where respectable men drank to a craze, fought with their brothers, fell into gullet holes and puked on the front hall float door. I'm from singers and yarn spinners, step dancers and card players, from whistlers who filled chambers with festival. I am from daily mascores, begrudgers and snitchers, know-alls and ignorant specimens, dirty-minded stock-ups who fattened on bad, brought down good with the tongue's wag. Buried in a box of buttons, beneath the parlour sideboard, that blackened bronze medal of Grand Uncle James who battled on the side of the enemy. I am from oddness of breed. This is my mottled weave. Um, there's a lot of, I suppose, work always going on in, in our home and uh, particularly work where you could earn a bit of money uh, on the side. And one of the things that a lot of my, mo my mother and my aunts did, did they, they, knitted, they knitted for money, craft. Fifty years I still hear the click clicking of steel needles. Our mother smothering late night silence. She knits the intricate stitch of cable 
trellis, moss and diamond, carved from patterns etched in her head. Blended with rhythm of finger shifts, she exudes harmony of flesh and intent. Delivers her deadlined parochial requests, gets cash for the craft of her iron sweaters. Our child hands to hold the hank, her only aid in the cast of her trade. As yarn laced her thinning sinews, time frayed her will, like the ripped rim of a fisherman's rib. Late nights, I knit my craft of words, infused by her music of duty, I reclaim significance. And this next poem is one that I've read. I've read it on the radio and I've read it a few places in Galway. And um, I was kind of surprised really with the reaction because people say, oh, read that one again, read that one again. And it's, you know, we've, uh, a lot of us well, from my uh, age group would have gone to convent schools. And I suppose the nuns were so important in our lives. Um, and especially in primary school, you know, you do something to please the nun be in the favour of the nun and more than other institutions there was a lot of inequalities as well between country children, town children, rich children, poor children and this is one of those issues that I've highlighted. Winter of Holy Posey. Be the favourite one eager to please the nun. First to place the winter posy on our schoolroom holy table. I eyed the blooming spot daily Three bleak January weeks stretched over silvery stone wall of the neighbour's field until they peeped from beneath the sycamore skirts a theatre of gallant and dainty bell-shaped snowdrops. Miniature beauties balanced on slender green stilts. Their flimsy notched curl petals shivered in the bitter as I plucked just ten for her blessed altar. Wrapped in a damp strip of pasty newspaper, I carried my prize find three miles to the nun's sacred bench. With ribboned bought bouquet, a town girl paraded before me. Country child dismissed like a dead briar in a ditch, I inhaled the harsh holy of my unfavoured winter posy. Uh, just one more of these, uh, and of course all of them are kind of city based, but they're all of the country. <laughs> So this is uh, called um, Floral Fair. My father was a great gardener and he was always out uh, selling flowers and growing flowers and we were involved with him as well. We did all the work that had to be done uh, in the garden, be, you know, preparing it for um, planting and picking stones and weeding. Um, it's really sorry now I have this ready. Time is okay, isn't it? Yeah. I have kind of what is Floral Fair. Not a day for thinning or digging, Sunday. You stood there after mass in your shy leather shoes. Suit trousers silver clipped with striped braces pulled over your white starch shirt, fresh as an early potato. You scanned the craft of your blooms in the front garden like a sergeant inspects his troops. You stooped to finger flimsy dahlia petals Remove redundant runners knotted in the stem. Tug lightly at stray shoots strung among the rose, the orange gladioli. Flick fluff from pink sweet willow or white flies from a rose leaf rib with your good handkerchief. You were folded in the fluency of your green trance until the summons of dinner dragged you to the kitchen table. Home after the stroke, when they edged you in by the gate, you limped lopsided to the front garden first to view the bloom before led inside <coughs> a lifetime floral affair still vibrant in the rhizomes of your mind. Um, I feel I have to do something for April, so I'm going to get away from the, the country ones, and I'm going to read uh, a poem called... Lord Saints, I haven't heard it. Uh, Fortune. Or Fortune Blossoms. Fortune blossoms. April air gripped in winter chill. Your pink petticoat frill peeps on boughs of crimson sheen. Welcome as a warm bath, your fluff flakes ooze newness. Soon your subtle blooms bulge, beauty queen of the green, you reign two short weeks. 
deposed like snow with the ebb and flow of mischievous breeze. Memories lame of your petted confetti, sprinkled on wedding day pledge of fidelity. Love wilted as fainted fragrance, fortune blossoms like second chance cherries. This is about a character that you might recognise as more current day piece. And I haven't read this before actually, as you read it. But I kind of associate him with, with a bit of soccer going on as well as the rugby. A little bit. Sorry. More soccer in rugby. And, and with the soccer in Limerick. We do. Yeah, yeah. We don't have much to do in Galway or in Clare. I anyway, this is. Okay. Fallen idol. Never want to show a spectacle. Dressed fresh in fondant white shirt, emerald em emblem tie, blade crease silk shirt, you caused commotion. Snare the simulators with your ceremonial suction, tight as heat sealed in a lagged cistern. Command expanded and wrapped itself around you, like the mushroom cloud of explosion. You trampled on decorum, skirted in civility penalties with a lavish hospitality, offered soft favours to flatter your followers, daunted detractors with the clout of the courts, you breathed invisible. When the end came, the facade of finances cracked, raised by your insider bent transactions, rotten as a dead tooth, your vanity deflated like a nearly knotted balloon, slipped away and fizzed around the room. You might know what that character is if you. Um, I think I better read here. Yeah, this is one that's a cover poem, and uh, it's I spent a lot of time in Connemara. And just as you go beyond Uktarard, the wow factor it hits you every time. A place called Glengowla, and no matter how many times I go out there, I say, "Oh my God!" Because the mountains just they appear, uh, and they're absolutely you know it's a stunning it's a stunning place to go. And I wrote this uh, during COVID. In fact, I did a lot of writing during COVID because I didn't have much more else to do, so I think the book might have been born then. Ambush. I always miss a breath beyond Kilgala driving west, where Scots Pine Hills switch to savage peaks. They peer from shifting quilts of purple, face for ambush. And I am glad to surrender, savour the awe of adamant rock, probing possibility. Relish the rebellion of rough boulders rising from rust boglands, stippled with polished grey blue mirrors of lake. Sky causes a lightness in my head. Ambushed by the semester of 2020, I am reduced to a brilliant simplicity. I will pass by these familiar forms again, know their clarity of contour, and find new perspectives. And uh, just in case you might think I'm not political, and as Bone said, we're all political anyway, everything we do is political. And I just did, finished a, a philosophy course uh, on the philosophy of poetry, and I'm after realising, I don't know, are we here at all, or is it <laughs> reality? What reality am I supposed to be sharing with you? And in, poetry, in, in philosophy, I, I know in, in Heidegger anyway, the, the term is, you're all preservers, the people who interpret the poet, poet's work are the preservers. Not that you preserve or anything to do with keeping it alive, but your interpretation, and then I suppose there's a kind of a truth in it, but it's a truth somewhere up there in the primordial. And I only got to get into this very recently and I realised I'm sure I'm hardly writing any poems at all. <laughs> However, it's just amazing all the, the different interpretations you get. And I, um, but you try to make a difference, I suppose, and that's part of it. This is called Witness and it's after the title of the book and I was a great fan of Robert Fisk. And you know, he was fantastic war reporter in the Middle East and Northern Ireland. And he only died, I think, about two years ago. Um, it's called Witness. When you stumbled at the corpse wall, rubble, shovels of limb and torso, cured on the red raw mortar, as the dumper driver snoozed immune to seared flesh, piled in blaze of noon, you penned your blade tail, rubbished the eye of neutral. When you stooped on the warehouse floor, Bundled bits of organ and bone lay filleted, frozen for family claim. As the handlers ordered their takeaway meal, you framed the fusion of brain cell and vomit, exposed the blunder of dispassionate automation, 
shifted the pivot of official to your witness precision. And another, I suppose we call this a war poem, that's the incidental right that we would be, I'd be reading something, considering what's happening uh, over in Ukraine. Uh, this is called um, Sailing Through Picasso's Rooms, and I was in Malaga just last year, this time last year, and uh, obviously to went to the Picasso Museum. I am swamped with guitars and bowls, strayed at pictures, perched behind thick lines, still of colour, spill on boards, gags my gnawing. Battle skulls drench me with memory, skeleton heads heaped in Khmer glass shrines, when twisted thought turns vile, quick as milk sours, cannibals gobble their own vomit flesh. I dock by the whole bunch of leeks, Sway with the drift of pallor to saturated pink. Picasso sheds war monochrome for his turquoise peace, as today innocence in wheat fields of the east, ready trench cocktails for the red beasts. My stomach squirms. Um, uh, I wasn't going to read this number, I think I will. Uh, it's called Goat. I just want to be political because of old stuff. I don't know what stand has got to come out with. I'm all flowers. You're all what? Flowers. Well done. Daffodils, presumably. Good. <clears throat> you leap between causes and fits, munching weeds on a briar ditch. The jester head grips your equilibrium, drags you to the thornless valley of silicon where deeds are drawn around water coolers that prop up the showman of your idolatry. Someday you will wear cemented earplugs, block the breeding box of bureaucracy, burst the drum of impulse that steers passage for the apparatus of popular pursuit. You will navigate the performance arena, spot depth beyond the giddiness of the tricksters. Men will stand to heed you, admire your absent-minded abandon. Some may even shelter and feed you, until you chew their underpants and drinks cans, return to your foraging herd on the ditches with your pitch perceptive data receptors, lip sensitive whiskers. You side book their system, jig with the hill circus. Uh, the last, this is my penultimate poem, and I, I have to read this because of minimum, and every bit of this is true, and it only really happened last June. Late June. I don't think it was July, it was late June. The Banner. Nothing quickens the pulse like a thoroughness excursion to the battle, battle of Bartha Blood's monster final Sunday. Pumped with promise, we fall into the ocean of street stalls, popped up bars and banner carrying revelers, poured into the holy hulk of hurling. Crossing the town bridge, we cavort with delirious allegiance. Sure as the early silage cut, we strut to Semple Stadium, cauldron of our dreams. On the Kalinan Terrace, we become ourselves, bunched tight as a greyhound's hide, draped in saffron and blue, move as one to thump the air, salute our parading players, their heads tattooed with winning before the bone-crushing throw-in. Rattled with high tackles, jostles, flare-ups and timbering, like a mother giving birth, the game engulfs us, with defiling tongue of curse, gush, spit and splutter, our decorum disappeared in first touch of the shitter. We ooze revenge for the referee's advantage denial, hail our teams every turn and score with bugle calls and chants in the blue smoke of our county core. Level at the hour mark, Match wrestled into extra time, with hook and block of added collision, our warriors wilt, sink to defeat on the thoroughest turf. We depart in a tank of pride, beneath our evening light, like albino peacocks, a waveless ocean deprived. We will battle another time. <laughs> so you know who won that one? That's <laughs> <laughs> my la the last one. And I time up, correct? The last one, to go to the store. And this is again in the 70s, late 70s, uh, maybe early 80s this was. To go to the store. 
Swing south on the crimson road of an August Friday. Pack your Volkswagen boot, hazel rods, volcano kettle and tangerine six-man tent. Leave in a blast of tunes as jingle of whistles and spoons spills from the squashed glove pocket. Halt at the pub, belly wobbling with giddy and thirst for buzz. Load up with stacks of amber and black. Grease your festival organs for a marathon of music in the town of speckled window boxes, lazy square and peeling church bells. Roll into the campsite field. Pitch your hazel rod tent, quick as a fiddle of fingers the round of a new air. Race to the takeaway van. Grab a newspaper bag of oily chips, laced thick with salt and vinegar. Wipe clean your dribbling chin and the fat of your pan, lips crisp for lilt like the dried reed of the river. Fall into the jaws of the weekend session. Batter, slide, shuffle and beat. Only in a ghost, breathless dream to go to the stone will never go again. Thank you. Please remember that, but immediately forget it as well. 
because if you're interested in trying to just you know find where the songs you know from Bruce Springsteen are in the poem, you're going to miss the magical narrative I've managed to create. <laughs> and I'd much rather you were interested in the magical narrative than whether or not your favourite Bruce Springsteen song is inside it. This is a political poem. I'm a socialist to my core. I have no understanding whatsoever how anybody on the planet can believe that we're not here to look after people. It baffles me. Uh, it baffles me more and more as I get older um, when there is incredible amount of evidence to show that other forms of economics do not work when it, looks, when it comes to lifting people up and giving them opportunities. Obviously, since it's written using Bruce Springsteen titles, it mentions America, um, but I think this can be applied to any country. And the core thing for me in this poem is we own the country, we elect politicians, they have to do what we ask them to do, and I think we forget that. Song to the Office. Growing up in the promised land, I have reason to believe from small things, big day, big things one day come. This land of hopes and dreams, <coughs> said dream, baby dream. Magic seeds fire with every wish you wish and high hopes fevered my American skin. My book of dreams, I would be the one born to run across the border to the king's highway, the chosen unsatisfied heart to find all that heaven will allow to bring the rising of one love to American land. Now my book of dreams and glory days are worlds apart. Phantoms of the souls of departed dreams block out the light of day. I'm a dead man living a slow fade on the edge of the world and I wish I were blind to life itself. And life itself. Out of work. Fifty-seven channels and nothing on and all that I'm thinking about is the ballad of a self-loathing pistol. Boom! 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 Out on the street another shackled and drawn nothing man fades away under empty skies. Counting on a miracle, a big paycheck from an easy money factory. He's one step up from the innocent brothers under the bridge whose high hopes are gone, gone, gone. Further on up the road, a mansion on the hill is living proof that it's all or nothing at all. There's the man at the top, <coughs> the local hero, and the word of the prodigal son. You can look, but you better not touch. I'm looking out for number one. Determination is the price you pay for better day. Surprise, surprise. This land, this life, has two hearts, two faces, the broken-hearted and the promised paradise. A roll of the dice, you're a fortunate son, a roll of the dice, you're out on the street, a roll of the dice, you're a lucky man in a lucky town, a roll of the dice, you're missing, and no one knows. A roll of the dice, that's what you get in the promised land. So I turn, 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 because deep down in the vault, a soul drive with eyes on the prize is always working on a dream. Yes, deep down in the vaults, chimes of freedom lift me up, point the way to paradise. Say, come on, son, get up. This land is your land. Raise your hand. This land is your land. And I'll stand by you always. Now, the second poem I'm going to do, I actually have really decided, it's probably the only one I had decided that I wasn't going to do tonight. And then you land in the Limerick, and I took a little ramble around because I was here a little bit early. Um, and then, of course, you realise you're surrounded by Irish history and Patrick Southey's barracks and all these other great um, Irish characters. And as I said, when I, I, was, I spent 21 years in the naval service, and you can tell by looking at me that I was very, very suited to military life. Um, <laughs> but as part of that um, work, I actually spent some time in Liverpool. We used to go up to Salisbury Barracks um, to collect stores, and I have a, a, a great memory where we drove from Cork to Liverpool in the old days when it took a long time to drive from Cork to Liverpool. And we arrived in Salisbury Barracks at quarter past twelve to collect 200 shirts. And I don't know if any of you have any, any connection with the, the Defence Forces. So their, their day stops at twenty past twelve for an hour and a half lunch break. Um, and the guy in the store said to me, I'm finished in five minutes, we'll never load the 200 shirts. And we said to him, but if you don't load them now, we're not going to get you back to court until four o'clock. And he closed the door. Right. And we had to wait until two o'clock. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the kind of thing that goes on. So this is a poem that has caused me untold psychological angst, is the only way of putting it. It caused me untold so, um, psychological angst when I was asked to write it. Cormac Lally asked me to be part of a project in 1916 for the anniversary the centenary anniversary, um, and you have to write three poems, one about Ireland in 1916, one about Ireland in 216, and God help us, one about Ireland in 3016. And my initial reaction was, I don't want to do it. 
Because I was, I, was, I was reared in England. I was born of Cork parents in Cork, but I lived in England from the age of four to 11. And when I came back to live here, I was very quickly obsessed with Irish history because it's the same story that we were being told in England, but it's very different. And the way I always um, caption that is, as far as I'm aware, nobody in Ireland has ever said these words. Cromwell is a legend. <laughs> and that's kind of what you're told on the other side of the uh, of the wall. But I found a way into doing the poem specifically about 1916, and I think this is kind of relevant as well today, when I thought about what we owe those people, and when I say we, I mean we, and it's very easy for me to say, and I genuinely do this, I'm completely anti-war, I don't believe in it, I think it's a complete waste of time and fucking energy. We lose people that nobody should lose, parents are burying very young children. It's, it's just, there's no wins. And of course that's very easy to say when you're living in a, in a relatively free land, and I'm sure if I was living in Ukraine right now, I might have a very different view on it. But what I began to think about was, you know, our debt to those people, and I started to think about our debt to the people who went to war on Easter Sunday to Free Ireland from, uh, obviously, a not very nice uh, neighbour and conqueror. Uh, so this is a piece that imagines what would be going through the mind of a man on the morning he got out of bed on Easter Sunday morning to go and fight for his country. And it imagines what would be motivating him and what might be um, concerning him. Now it's written from the point of view of man. I 100% acknowledge that women went as well. They've been you know, pretty much eradicated from history. It's horrendous. Um, but the song titles of the Wolf Tones and the Douglas and God bless Ronnie Drew for having the solo career because this wouldn't have been finished any flat. Kind of led it to be written from a man's point of view. So this is called Restless Farewell. Goodbye, my darling sleep. Goodbye, my little son. I'm off to Dublin in the green for Ireland. My Ireland. I know, my love, this is the day a lament for the loss and the right of man will breeze from Clare to here. I know, my love, this is the day the Derry air and Dingle Bay hear the call of bold Fenian men. James Larkin, Padraig Pierce, and the answer. From sweet Tralee to Skibbereen, where the sun and a soldier's song is rising, will be wrapped in when you fly around me, boys, and we shall overcome. So blow ye winds a dream of liberty, blow ye winds a Celtic symphony, and over Ireland all let the people sing rebellion, freedom, go home, you British soldiers, you'll never beat the Irish. And blow ye winds of providence to protect. So at our journey's end, when the boys come rolling home, or the women of Ireland see a soldier return, not a bunch of red roses on holy ground, and bagpipe music at a gravestone, Martial lies a soldier. Yes, blow ye winds of providence to protect. So at our journey's end, every soldier's son can hug the old man and know once more your old sweet song. And blow ye winds of providence for the working man in Belfast and the boys of Fair Hill, who remembering the flight of the earls, Robert Emmett and the brave Humble who win freedom from the big strong man. I know my love in Belfast and Botany Bay, Irish eyes are smiling, for this is the day the foggy dew in the valley of Knockinore and the gay Galtee Mountain sings a song for Ireland, my Ireland. I know, my love, this is the day that water for boys and Galway girls were in the green of Ireland, my island, march to freedom. Yes, my darling son. Yes, my little son. This is the day. So goodbye, Irene. Goodbye, lovely John. I'm off to Dublin with James Connolly and Michael Collins to say farewell. To an island on fruit. I'm used to the Ove, you always clap at the end of poems and Ove, and it's fucking very hard, it's just deathly silent. It's just an observation. So I'm going to do one more political one before we move it on, um, and this is a poem that is actually very dear to me. Um, it was written in 2017 um, when I was asked um, to go to Coventry as part of the Ove Coventry, they have a poetry exchange and they do every year. And most people's response to being asked to go to Coventry is to remember that old phrase, when you're sending me to Coventry. <laughs> Mine wasn't. Mine was to remember an interview I'd seen with a man called Terry Hall, who was the lead singer with the specials, and we tragically lost um, just before the end of last year. 
and I read an interview of him, I'm going to say in Smash Hits, at that time it was most likely Smash Hits, where he was asked um, what was it like growing up in Coventry, and his response was Coventry is a shithole. <laughs> nobody should ever go there. <laughs> so I wrote this poem before I went, and I wrote it using song titles from the Two Tone label. Now there's a couple of cheats in here, I don't know, I may explain, but over the, over the is down there, and I'm going to make it very clear. I am very much aware that bands like The Beat and Madness signed a one single contract with Two Tone, and everything else they released was on other record labels, but like uh, Go Beat, was it Go Beat or Go Feet? The, the, anyway, it doesn't matter. And I'm also critically aware that the song, the poem is called Spirit of 79, so it was based in 1979, and I know Ghost Town and Nelson Mandela came out after that time. But it's a poem that reflects on 1979 and the world we lived in, and I, when I say we, I talk about me. I remember when the, the recession came in the late 2000s, saying to people, this is compared to what we grew up in, you know, almost paradise. We, I came out of school in 1982, and when I say there was no work, I mean there was no work. All my friends, and I literally mean all of them, ended up in England. I went into the Irish Navy Service, so I was blessed to get that, but there was literally no work. And I heard a talk recently um, by a local historian called made an observation that actually struck me like a baseball bat. I'm sure there's other parts of the country that had the same thing happened in Cork. It was Fords and Dunlops and all these close clothes, very close together. And you had thousands of unemployed men married with children. And they all bought vans and set themselves up as roofers and this kind of thing, but there was no work for a friend either. And the observation was there was an entire generation of men made redundant in the prime of their life, and they never worked again. And that's what we were dealing with in 1979. This is called Spirit of 79. Every Friday night and Saturday morning when the young at heart come together to twist and crawl out on the streets, this dirty old town drowns in hairspray, Blank expression, bright lights and alcohol. The soul salvation of the young, the black and the gifted. At 4am, Jeanette, a skinhead girl, she's going, they're all out to get you, they're all out to get you. While bad boys make monkey man noises, they're requiem for a black soul over and over again. Why, you're wondering now, does this concrete jungle do nothing but drop pressure to get a job on the rat race? Why, you're wondering, is free Nelson Mandela on my radio? Why does the government man believe our land of hope and glory can promise this ghost home better must come when the dawning of a new era is such a long shot? When every day the young, the black and the gifted hear the mirror in the bathroom whisper, I can't stand it, they're selling out your future. And prospects are mere calling cards for the government whose overture of it's up to you to get a job. What? That is an embarrassment when our house has no money and tomorrow's dream is forever one step beyond tomorrow being just another grey day. So shut up, Mr. Government Man. You don't know, like I know, that in the middle of the night the shadow of fear is the only noise in this world. How the doors of my heart tighten up when the wine and grind of facing situations too much for one too young tells me my dream is in deep water. How when dawn arrives, I get busy doing nothing every day. Saturday night, Sunday morning, the lonely crowd on the streets again. This, believe me, is their dream. Running away from the everyday with a knife on the tires. Running away from situations too much for one too young. Running away from the madness of the mirror in the bathroom this spring. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I just can't stand it. I know it's going to get very sure for me. But now we're going to talk about mental health. Uh, what time is this? Court nine on a Wednesday night. Lumic, what else would you be doing? <laughs> So, the book is, um, is in four sections. The first section is called Revolution. Those three poems are all in there. The second one is Words of Love. The third one is Mind Games, which is the mental health. And the fourth one is Got to Get You In, which is a kind of miscellaneous section. Being a Beatles fan, I titled them all out of Beatles songs, even though there's not um, a Beatles poem in here that didn't make the cut, which is rather tragic when John Lennon was one of my greatest heroes. Um, so Terry Hall, that was the lead singer with the specials, um, that were a huge part of the two-tone uh, thing. I don't know if anybody knows, but he had this morose 
delivery on stage, you used to stand there really sour faced, like really unhappy. Yeah. Terry Hall was um, sexually abused as a child and abducted, abducted when he was 11 years old, so he had very good reasons to look for us. The, the very fact that he ended up fronting a band, never mind a massively successful band, and pursuing creative career was almost miraculous. And I mention that because um, I've had a long, long run with um, mental health, um, mental ill health as I like to call it myself. I was diagnosed with depression in 2006. It's based on childhood trauma, very difficult childhood trauma. I don't know if there's such a thing as not difficult childhood trauma. And it comes in lots of shapes and sizes, and I know when I look at mine, it's not the, it's not, you know, not the worst kind of um, childhood trauma. It wasn't sexually abused, it was a you know, very difficult home life. Um, so the, you know, the mental health scenario in Ireland is of great interest to me. And when you read things about you know, gangs of volunteers on bridges in Limerick on Friday and Saturday night trying to make sure that young men and women don't jump into the river, you kind of have to wonder what the fuck is going on. Um, and it's, I mean, it's very prominent in young men, it's changing, it's, you know, it's affecting men of all ages. The demand for mental health services during and after the pandemic has increased by 400%. The government seems to have, don't give a, I mean, they just don't seem to care. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a road safety authority, but when you look at the amount of money the road safety authority gets, in comparison to what mental health gets and the amount of deaths involved in both, it's actually, it's so upside down, it's, it's quite incredible. Um, so there's a much longer introduction to this, and I'm, I'm going to skip quite a chunk of it. This poem was inspired by a number of things, but what it ended up being was me sitting down and thinking, okay, this situation on mental health in this country is absolute shit. And if we're going to change it, we have to start getting really honest about what's going on. And that starts, for me, with you being honest about what's going on for you. I've been in therapy for 14 years now. I'd highly recommend it. If you're not in therapy, get one as soon as you can. I can recommend more than one. Um, <laughs> So this is without doubt the most honest poem I've ever written and it's, it, what interests me about the way I approach this stuff is that I'm using somebody else's material to get into things that I can't express in my own words. So I wouldn't have been able to write this if I wrote, sat down to write it myself. I wrote this using, and it's completely irrelevant, but I wrote this using the Peshmoga song title and I'm a massive fan. I'm, I mean, Dave Gain, is, you know, he was fucked up for a long time, but. This is not a comment on them, this is a complete and honest comment on myself. This is called Policy of Truth. I've tried so hard to memorize this, but it just never works, so I'm just going to read it. The truth is tonight, a dark trance has spent the night. The truth is this happens all the time to broken, damaged people. The truth is I am broken, damaged, fractured. The truth is it's no good being broken, damaged, fractured. The truth is Broken, damaged people feel free love, is strange love. The truth is broken, damaged people are always fools to fragile tension. The truth is fractured and damaged people rush to pain. The truth is broken, damaged people surrender to addiction, fall into the abyss. The truth is for broken, damaged people choosing the dark road is the price of love. The truth is choosing the dark road is a pain that I'm used to. And suffer well. The truth is, broken, damaged people always rebirth stories of all. The truth is, in a world full of nothing, scared, sacred shame soothes my soul. The truth is, addiction tears you apart. The truth is, sometimes, in the dead of night, I wish I were dead. The truth is, I promise you, I will hold on. The truth is the child inside is miles away, gone, lost. The truth is all I ever wanted was to shake the disease. The truth is I just can't get enough of endless excess and compulsion. The truth is I'm useless, I've gone too far, a horror story. The truth is pain stripped my joy. The truth is pain shouldn't have done that. The truth is one thing, one caress can light my son. The truth is, the future starts here. The future is turning away from condemnation. I feel love. The truth is, I promise you, I will just try. The truth is, the great outdoors soothes my soul. The truth is, better days remotivate me. The truth is, I'm in control. The truth is, nothing is impossible. The truth is, I like that research. The truth is, I am human. And the truth. 
It's all right. And you. Mm. Oh, we do it for time, don't we? Yeah. Because oh. I just keep rattling away, like. Oh, you five, just know five, 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 five minutes. minutes. Are you okay to rattle on for another? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna um if I can find it. I'm gonna read a poem that I'm using um the cave song to it. I I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a late bloomer when it comes to the cave. It kind of bypassed me for a, an awful long time. Um and then I'm I'm not even sure how. I mean I, I was aware of a couple of tracks like Into Into Your Arms, which is if you don't know it, just Google it, it's just an amazing piece of music and a wonderful, wonderful piece of writing um, and a couple of other pieces and then, I don't know, somehow he came into my, into my life and I'm, I'm a, a fanatic now at this stage. I've never seen him live which is a great uh, shame but I will do. Let me just have a look here where this is in this one because um, if I was down there now and somebody else was doing this we'd go, what the fuck is that line I don't know this? I think you'd know where the fucking poem is. You know I mean? Oh yeah, it's the last poem in the book, you think I remember that as well. So, Nick Cave ha um, has had a, an amazing life in lots of ways and he's had, a, in the last number of years, an incredible amount of grief. His, one of his teenage twins fell off a cliff um, in Brighton and was killed. And it's had an absolutely massive impact on him. He's done an amazing book with a guy called Sean O'Hagan, which is a series of interviews where his honesty and um, compassion around grief is just almost overwhelming. And he has written two albums around the gone on tour with him, you know, and he's bared his soul and his heart like, to everybody for you know to do what you want with it. I actually wrote this poem. Um, I think I wrote it after Sunday, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but it's an interesting piece. It's the poem that closes the uh, the collection. It's always meant to close the collection because it's called the farewell song. Um, it is very dark. I will tell you that. And then if you feel like collapsing in the middle of it, stay with it because the next one is much brighter and you'll be okay when you leave. This is called the farewell song. Push the sky away. Let the bells ring. That lovely creature, the first ball, is dead. I sat side, sadly by her side in a candlelit bedroom when my little doll's faint heart and wide lovely eyes fell away. Oh my lord, when the fight was over, how oh, grief came riding into my arms, and like an idiot prayer, an avalanche of memories rushed to me, her black hair, green eyes, red dress, and the voice, oh, the voice. That love letter could say a spell in ninety-nine ways, carry me breathless and be dazzled to happy birthday capers on sunny sand. Watching Alice and Cindy wade in the water in mini skirts, or our family story time, or another rather lovely thing in the kitchenette, the fable of the brown egg, Mickey Bloody Mouse conversations. Lament rose and shivers with one autumn memory of counting stars in the distant sky on a rainy night in Soho after the lightning bolts of fireworks over the river. And my rambling mind mixed memories of her red dress and the red clock, dolphins and a honey bee on the window, mermaids in the bath in the house beside the church in Tupelo. Hold on to yourself, I said over and over. Hold on to yourself. Falling into the well of misery, can't do what must be done. And what must be done, must be done. So farewell, my love. Let the bells ring goodbye and cry your death. Nor your funeral is the end. Not so long as there is a light in my sad, dark eyes. Now, turn up the heat there because it's something I'm very fucking cold. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to just do one more if I can. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with a, a positive poem. So, um, Oh, by the way, I noticed your reference to Telegram Sam in the poem, just in case nobody else did I got it. Um, Mike Bond? Yeah, hang on. Yeah, yeah. So, so for me, you know, a, a journey with mental health has massive challenges in it, massive challenges. And I remember very early on, I, I, you know, I think you have to, 
you have to work at getting well, and I think everybody can get well. That's not to say everybody will get well, but everybody can get well. Um, and you need a number of things, and one of them is to have good people around you, but I think everybody has good people around them once you begin that journey. Uh, and I have an aunt uh, who lives in England who is to this day incredibly good to me and was incredibly, incredibly good to me when I started out on the journey of trying to figure out what's going on for me. I'd often spend two hours on the phone to her. And my job was paying for it because I know days WhatsApp covers that. Um, and I remember she said to me at one stage, you know, because she had been through her own challenge, she'd had a breakdown, she'd gone through a divorce, she's had a lot of mental health issues, she's done a lot of she'd done done a lot of uh, learning around that. And she said to me, you know, she said, in the long run, depression is a blessing. And I thought, my oh, fuck is she talking about it? But she's actually right. If you deal with it, it's a blessing. So what it's allowed me to do, it's allowed me to look at my childhood. Um, to understand my childhood, to understand where my parents were coming from when I was a child and where they, how they got to where they got to through their childhood. And that's all very complicated, families are complicated. Um, and what it's also allowed me to do is to be comfortable with who I am and what I am and what I do. I wouldn't be standing here in front of you if I hadn't undertaken the journey. I certainly wouldn't be standing here in front of you wearing my poetry coat. Uh, that's its official title. It was a poetry coat. It was, um, Elevated to a poetry cloak after a recent event, I wear it for all my poetry readings these days. It's it's a handy um, prop because you know if you're bored out of your tears with what I'm saying and reading, you can just look at the coat and it's very colourful <laughs> and it can distract you quite easily. Yeah, I forgot where I was now. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so I have it really. And the blessings that are attached to that are absolutely enormous. But for, for any human being, I think at any age to be able to be really confident who they are, what they are, what their gifts and talents are, and we all have gifts and talents, we all have them. There are words I would never attribute to myself, you know, anything up to 10 years ago, maybe even a little bit less than that. But that's the reward for the work. And I don't even like the word work. It's the reward, reward for the coping mechanisms that you apply. And I've applied a lot more over the years. I worked for a very long time with affirmations, I still work with Julia Cameron's artist way techniques, I don't know if anybody's aware of them. Um, and on a daily basis, I wake, my, my day begins and ends with writing, handwriting. Um, and it ends with a gratitude list. And there are countless things that are good for your brain, and your brain is a muscle that can be rewired. And there's scientific evidence galore that certain practices improve the positive side of your brain. Gratitude is one of them. Um, this is a poem about gratitude. Sorry. This is a poem written using song titles of a band who have a reputation for being one of the most depress depressing bands on the planet. It is totally un um, unjustified. The band are called the Eels. They're from America. They're really one guy. I think they're fucking amazing. So when I went out, set out to write this, I thought, what if I write something positive? Um, and I managed to do that. And then I went, to Rome, right, went away and wrote a second one, which is the B side of a 12 year single that's never going to be released. <laughs> And that's as dark as fuck. That's called the medication is wearing off. But uh, I'm not going to read that tonight. That's not even in the collection. Um, so this is called In Gratitude for This Magnificent Day. It actually has been a magnificent day, not just from the point of view of the weather, although it was shit when I was driving down. But every day is a magnificent day if you, take, if you try and take a good over it. I want to say thanks again, Dominic, for having me. You've been unbelievably good for the creative process and the writing process in Limerick. You've been very kind to me over the years. I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out, giving of your time to listen to me fucking waffle on and allow me to share what I feel are my gifts with you. You may feel like wasting my fucking time. I have no problem with you being wrong. Thank you very much. This is called In Gratitude for this magnificent day. I'm a hummingbird this morning. I'm feeling so good and fit in with the misfits. And my useless trinkets tattoo love the loveless on rusty pipes in our cathedral. In the yard, behind the church, a Jehovah's Witness prays into God's silence for a good deal. While a pretty, strawberry, straw, I can never say that word, strawberry blonde ballerina with eyes down, dreams about being a true original. And an altar boy with a fly swatter, fingertips daisy looking up through concrete, at sky writing that says, Oh, what a beautiful morning. There's something strange about an altar boy with a fly swat, but I like the way this is going. So when an oh so lovely lilac breeze flowers 
and animals answer bone dry apples that shine like blinking lights. A sweet little thing, a kindred spirit maybe, tips along that feels like the beginning of I can't help falling in love into this town. And an overture filled with all the beautiful things I have to offer. My sad raincoat, a $200 tattoo, the mistakes of my youth. Soars like a swallow in the sun singing, hey man, now you're really living. And I know, today is the day the strange friends man up and bow out of the quandary of the last time we spoke, you were so unpleasant. Man, where I'm at is an epiphany. And the only thing I care about is living the mystery of life. So at dusk, I am building a shrine to this wonderful, glorious and magic world. Because these are the things the grandchildren should know. In gratitude for this magnificent day. I'm a hummingbird, filled with longing, and it feels like the beginning of I can't help falling in love with all of these beautiful things. Thank you so much. Good luck. 